Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, okay, I think I'm just going to share my screen and go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me and haven't been to one of these talks before, um, I've done several for the Rye Free Reading Room. Um, Catherine has been so great. I love uh, doing these talks for you guys. Um, my name is Sarah Wasberg Johnson. I am a food historian. I got my website up right there on the bottom if you're interested. Um, and as I was telling Catherine earlier, and I'll, if you remind me, I'll drop it in the chat. At the end of the talk, um, I just did a big feature for thekitchen.com called The Cookie Time Machine. So we're actually not gonna be talking about too many of the cookies um, from that in this talk tonight. We're gonna be talking more about traditional American Christmas cookies. Um, but that talk was, uh, I picked an iconic historic cookie recipe for every decade from 1920 to 2010. Uh, and then um, Jesse Sheehan, who's the author of Vintage Bakes, um, did a modern twist on all the historic cookies. So if you wanna check that out, you can look it up or I, I'll drop the, the um, link in the chat at the end. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat or at the end we can uh, unmute. I'm gonna leave all the questions till the end. Um, Catherine, if anyone has like a clarifying question, please feel free to interrupt me. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right. So I thought we would talk a little bit about how cookies in general come into being. So the ancient ancestor of the cookie is an unleavened hard bread. Um, most, excuse me, most grain producing cultures around the world have some version of unleavened bread. Um, and some of them are sweetened with honey, but it's really not until the uh, 700s um, in the common era that we start to add sugar to some of these unleavened hard breads. So the Persians are considered some of the first people um, to make what we would consider in the modern era to be a cookie, right? The Persian empire ended up uh, going to modern day India where sugar cane uh, originates uh, and they started bringing sugar back to the ancient world, the Mediterranean world. Medieval Europe, um, sugar is really the purview of the wealthy in medieval Europe. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, it's usually used as like a garnish or a spice. And so you'll see a lot of those early um, cookie recipes are sweetened with honey. And then we do get um, the introduction of some of these types of cookies through the Moorish invasion of Spain, right? So they introduce a lot of Arab foods to Europe via Spain, um, things like almonds, things like apricots, things like um, citrus fruits, other things that have come along the Silk Road uh, via Arab traders um, all end up in Europe largely through Spain. So these are some of the spices that were available um, in medieval Europe. We have ginger, black pepper, just coming along, um, black pepper, cinnamon, saffron, are all coming along um, the spice, the Silk Road uh, from China and Southeast Asia. It's an overland route. Uh, we also have more locally to the Mediterranean in Europe, we have wine, almonds, honey, anise, and caraway. And those are really the main flavoring agents behind a lot of cookies in the medieval period. The 16th century, things start to change a little bit. We get into the age of sale, right? And with that, we're kind of um, trying to find shortcuts to, to Asia and kind of avoid those long, long overland um, routes. And with that comes the, um, the introduction of a number of other spices. Um, we get more and more access to sugar. We have more access to nutmeg and mace, which are both from the same. Um, mace is like the covering of the nutmeg nut, <coughs> excuse me. We get cloves, allspice, cardamom. Um, those are all coming from the spice islands, right? And primarily British and Dutch traders were trying to bypass Spanish control of South Africa and the sail routes and also to bypass Italian control of, of the Arab overland trade. And what ends up happening is there's just a ton of violence 
uh, in Southeast Asia uh, as Europeans are trying to wrest control of these very expensive, very wealth producing spice islands from the indigenous people wresting trade from Arab and Chinese traders. Um, and there's just a lot of murder <laughs> and pillaging. If you're interested in learning more about the background um, behind the spice trade in the 16th century, particularly nutmeg, which was considered the most valuable of the spices, recommend a book called Nathaniel's Nutmeg that gives you a really great um, in-depth, very readable overview of, of the European obsession with spices and the lengths that they went to get them. Um, so as you might have uh, deduced from some of the things I've been talking about, uh, cookies, particularly early on, are really uh, reserved for the wealthy. And spices are a big part of that. Spices were quite valuable. Um, a shipload of nutmegs would turn every man on that boat into the modern day equivalent of a millionaire or even a billionaire overnight. Um, so the other ingredients too can be quite costly or rare, particularly in the winter time. So we have honey and sugar, not necessarily abundant. Butter, not necessarily abundant in the winter time. Uh, refined white flour was very labor intensive and uh, resource intensive to produce in the medieval and early modern period. Uh, nuts, if you didn't live in a place where nuts were largely available, importing nuts, particularly almonds, could be quite expensive. That's why we get marzipan in the medieval period is really um, what a lot of very wealthy people are consuming. Eggs are not super available in the winter. And of course, like I said, spices uh, were also very expensive. Then there's also the difficulty in baking cookies. You can't bake cookies over an open fire. You need an oven. And most people in the medieval period and the early modern period, really even into the early American colonial period did not necessarily have access to bake ovens. Um, in the medieval period, you might have a village baker or the great estates would have bake ovens, but individual people did not. Um, in early modern America, a lot of people did have bake ovens, but a lot of people didn't. Um, so it, you can't really bake cookies in a Dutch oven. <laughs> so that's part of the reason why pie is so popular in the United States, but that's another talk. Um, and then of course also the association of feasting with Christmas in the medieval period, you had about a month of fasting. And then you had almost a month of feasting. Um, you know, there was the Christmas feasting all the way up to Twelfth Night. And some places, some countries actually continued beyond Twelfth Night their feasting. Um, so you were saving up and celebrating. And so, you know, even in the poorer households, you would save up uh, your more expensive or more scarce ingredients for the holidays. The baking itself, I mentioned that cookies, you need a bake oven to bake them and I'll show you what that looks like in the next slide. Um, but then there was also some other things that you needed, not necessarily needed, but that became quite popular for cookies. A lot of early Christmas cookies were baked in molds. So they're almost three dimensional. They're producing three dimensional cookies. Um, and then also we have some changes in our sweeteners that kind of influence whether or not we're using molds. Um, cookies that are made with honey take to molds much better than cookies that are made with sugar. So because of that, and also because sugar um, cookies started to be commercially produced, we do get cookie cutters like this one. And then you also, um, as cookies get smaller, because some of the early ones are quite large, uh, you need something to bake them on. So you get the development of cookie sheets, tin cookie sheets, right? And then of course, like I said, it's much easier to do this kind of um, refined, baking in a wealthy versus an average household. You have more access to um, kind of ingredients. You have more access to the, the tools you need to bake cookies, most, mostly, most importantly, the bake oven. And then you have the rise of professional bakers, which also helps give rise to our cookie cutters. Um, I'll explain this cookie cutter a little bit. This is from the mid 19th century, which is really when um, tin-based products started to take off in the United States. Um, this is a Pennsylvania, uh, probably Pennsylvania Dutch or Pennsylvania Deutsch um, cookie cutter, and it's a heart and a hand. So I just thought that was great because it was very unusual. 
Uh, so this is a medieval period image uh, illustrating a bake oven. So how bake ovens work is they're basically just big hollow spaces with heat retaining and fireproof materials, usually brick, sometimes stone, there's usually like some kind of clay or mortar lining the inside. And you build a fire inside of it. And once it gets really hot, you rake the fire out. So I think what's going on here, they have a fire in front of the bake oven. Then you load it up with whatever you want um, that needs the highest heat first, and you shut it up. And then you take those things out and it's like, you have declining levels of heat, right? So if you started your bake oven and it's ready at, I don't know, noon, you're not gonna be able to bake cookies at 7 p.m. because <laughs> your bake oven has already cooled down too much for you to bake cookies. So it really, you had to really plan what you were going to bake and when and be really prepared. So it was kind of a big, um, big production. Uh, and in the United States, usually the last thing that would go in the bake oven was a pot of beans. And then you would shut the, the door of the oven and seal it and leave it overnight. And so you'd have baked beans in the morning. So when we talk about baking on Saturdays, right, the days of the week of when you're supposed to do everything, that 19th century uh, little ditty, uh, then if you put it, things in the oven on Saturday night, then on Sunday, when you weren't supposed to do any work, if you're in a Christian household, um, you had uh, food ready and still warm because it was still in the bake oven. So shaping cookies, we talked a little bit about uh, cookie cutters and cookie molds. Cookie molds are very medieval, um, but they do continue really into the 18th and in some instances into the 19th century. Cookie cutters, um, the earliest records of cookie cutters date to the 15th century, but they are not in widespread use until the 19th century. And then you also get the development of the cookie press um which like extrudes the cookie dough again the earliest reference to that is the 16th century um but it does not become super popular really in the united states until miro aluminum company um invents their cookie gun in the 1930s and then you see kind of an explosion of those extruded cookies which we'll talk about later um why do we call <laughs> Why did the British say biscuit and the Americans say cookie, right? That's kind of like the title of my talk. Um, so biscuit, and I put the hyphen in the wrong place in the French, I'm sorry. Biscuit comes to the British from the French. Cree means cooked. So biscuit uh, means cooked twice, right? Most people cite the Latin. I was like, the British are not getting it from ancient Latin text. They're getting it from the French, right? The French are the ones who are introducing that term to them. And um, then, of course, in Italian, biscotti means the same thing, twice baked. Um, biscotti, it's more accurate because biscotti are actually twice baked and other um, British biscuits are not necessarily. So where does the term cookie come from? Uh, it comes from the Dutch kukje. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It probably sounds more Norwegian than Dutch, and that's because I speak a little bit of Norwegian. I don't speak any Dutch. <laughs> um, but it means small cake. So cake is a cake and cookie is like the diminutive version of the cake. Uh, cookie in other languages, there are some similar roots. Uh, in Norwegian, it's small cake, which means a small cake. Um, in Spanish, it's galleta, uh, which does not have a clear origin, which I find very interesting. So it's a little different than the other Romance languages. And in German, it's plätschen. Uh, which means a little place deriving from plots, meaning a flat round cake, right? So these are kind of the generic terms used to describe cookies. Now, what I haven't been able to figure out is why American fluffy biscuits are called biscuits. <laughs> um, and there is also some overlap in the United States. Um, biscuit in the 19th century did mean the fluffy Southern baked good, um, but particularly in commercial venues, it did also mean like the British version where it's a small, crisp, sweet cookie. So you'll see some of that overlap um, in advertising and things like that. So spelling wise, I just had to do a little Google engram of all the possible spellings of cookies. I only made it go to the 1950s so you could actually see the other 
<laughs> the other spellings on the graph, you go to the modern period, that blue line just goes right up to the top. Um, so I do find it interesting that in the 20th century, cookie spelled with a Y is still giving uh, cookie spelled with an I, e, a little bit of a run for its money, especially in the 19 teens. Uh, but cookie with an IE for whatever reason, that's the one that sticks. Um, okay, sorry, uh, somebody has drawn lines on my slide. So um, I'm not really sure how that That might have been actually me, I'm sorry about that. Okay, that's fine. I'm using my phone. <laughs> you know how to undo it? It's very distracting, I'm sorry. All right, well, we'll just keep going and if you figure it out, uh, if you could just take those off, that'd be great. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the Dutch origins um, of cookies here in the United States. So obviously New York, you guys know this, is a Dutch colony until 1664 when the British took over. Again, cookie yeah, is small cake. That's where the word cookie comes from. Um, interestingly, in the New Netherland colony, cookies were associated largely with funerals and New Year's Day. Um, and that is because in large part, uh, British Puritans and other Protestants, but particularly the Puritans, um, thought that celebrating Christ Christmas was a vile pagan holiday that had no place in the church. Um, and so that kind of prevented a lot of Christmas celebrations. So a lot of the um, Dutch Christmas celebrations get associated with New Year's Day uh, in, in, early, in the early colonies. Um, that really changes as we get into the 18th century. The first print reference we have the word cookie and not quite spelled that way um, is 1703 uh, and it's in reference to 800 cookies being served at a Dutch funeral in New York. And then of course in the Dutch tradition, uh, St. Nicholas Day, which was just a couple days ago, um, it's traditional in the Netherlands to serve speculas or speculus right, usually in the shape of St. Nicholas or sometimes in the shape of a windmill. It's a type of um, similar to gingerbread, which we'll, we'll talk more in depth about speculus later. Uh, but I found this sweet little illustration from a Dutch book of poetry. And here's St. Nicholas in his bishop's mitre uh, delivering a giant cookie to this very surprised little boy. <laughs> uh, and then of course, if you've ever had Biscoff cookies, you have had speculus, that's what, that's what those are. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different types of cookies and some of their origins, right? So gingerbread is probably one of our oldest Christmas cookies. It dates back to medieval Europe, but particularly um, medieval Germany. I have a friend who is also a food historian named Neil DiMarino uh, and his, he found a 14th century recipe, so this is from the 1300s, and the, that gingerbread recipe is just a mixture of honey, breadcrumbs, and ginger. Uh, I've tasted it, not that great, <laughs> but I think in a time period when you had very limited access to sweet things, it probably would be a lot better. Um, so that's a very early recipe. Black pepper is also a common ingredient um, in a lot of early gingerbread recipes because ginger and black pepper were available quite early on in Europe and we don't get those other um, spices like uh, nutmeg and cloves and allspice until later, um, you know, when Europeans start to invade the spice, island, spice islands. Uh, so some examples of uh, traditional Christmas cookies that use black pepper are pfeffernusa, um, and then also peppercocker, which are Scandinavian, uh, very thin, crisp gingerbread, and, and black pepper is the primary flavoring ingredient there. Um, you also have Queen Elizabeth has documented um, use of gingerbread. She uh, had gingerbread figures made of diplomats who attended um, a diplomatic feast. And they were not like, you know, the stick figure gingerbread cutouts, <laughs> cut, cut out cookies that we think of today. They were more like these guys over here, right? This very detailed, this is a um, gingerbread mold that could also be used for Mars Pan. Right, it's a very detailed figure and you can tell that by impressing it with the dough, you're gonna get like a very three-dimensional, very detailed figure. And that was the type of gingerbread that was quite common um, in the time period, uh, leading up really until 
the 18th and early 19th century when when people started to use particularly commercial bakers started to use um, uh, cookie cutters more than the molds. Uh, this is a great little piece of art that I thought I would share um, shows the importance of gingerbread. Uh, the translation of this title is various people in front of an illuminated stall at a church fair. Right, so, and you can see um, this stall right here, all of these heart shaped brown things sitting on the shelves, those are all gingerbread. Right, so gingerbread in a lot of European countries, um, there was some luck associated with it, there was some, um, you know, some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? People would intentionally buy certain gingerbread figures in hopes that those things would come true in their lives. So um, you might buy a couple if you wanted to get married. You might buy a heart to express love. You might buy a Christ child if you were hoping to get pregnant, that kind of thing. Um, and I thought we would also talk, we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of immigrant traditions, but I thought we'd start with the British because um, we did the Dutch and next the United the early America was uh, a British colony, but the British don't have a ton of cooking traditions. Interestingly enough, their primary Christmas tradition is uh, Christmas pudding. Uh, and they had stir about Sunday, which is usually the weekend before Advent, when the whole family would come together to stir the pudding so it would age in time to be uh, boiled or steamed for Christmas dinner. They also really like mince pies, <laughs> mince meat pies in uh, in Britain. So that is another very old um, combination of minced meat or ground meat uh, with chopped fruit, um, usually first wine and then later distilled liquor like brandy, spices, sugar, and then that's another thing that you would age it uh, and then bake into pie. Fruit cake, also popular in Britain. Um, the Medieval British great cakes are, are the antecedents of our modern fruit cake. And then they did also have gingerbread and shortbread, which we'll get to in a couple of slides. Um, Christmas starts to change in Britain with uh, Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert, who was a German prince, right? He's from Germany. So he brought a lot of German traditions to Great Britain, including the use of Christmas trees. Prior to Prince Albert, um, British people and really early Americans did not uh, celebrate with Christmas trees unless you had German ancestry, right? Victoria, Queen Victoria helps popularize that for the general public. So this is a great little uh, 1870s postcard, but it's got this, you know, ye olde timey English spelling. And so the whole family is getting together to make this Christmas pudding. And the legend went that every family member um, would take a stir and make a wish and then their wish would come true after Christmas, after they'd eaten up the pudding. So that's why everybody has a little spoon here because they're, they're all getting ready to take their turn stirring the Christmas pudding mixture. All right, shortbread. Shortbread is not English, even though they do consume it. Um, it's invented in Scotland in the 12th century but it really doesn't start to take off until the 17th century. The 16th century, the 1500s in Scotland were not a great time. <laughs> there was plague, there was famine, there were a lot of failed crops. Um, as we get into the 1600s, the 17th century, things start to improve. Uh, we get, the Scots get um, improved access to English markets, right? So their economy starts to improve a little bit. Uh, and they also dramatically expand their dairy cattle herds which means there is plenty of butter available to make shortbread. Mary Queen of Scots was said to be very fond of shortbread. So she helps popularize it during the Elizabethan era. Um, and then Queen Victoria, again, with her Christmas popularizing um, is a little bit obsessed with Scotland, right? So she helps popularize it in the Victorian period. And this is just an image of um, um, again, a cookie mold. This is Scottish molded shortbread um, showing the, the Scotch symbol of the thistle um, and it's cut into wedges, which is more traditional than um, you know individual cookies. So cookies in America, does anything really change when they start to come to the United States? Um, yes and no, 
Americans, more Americans are able to eat cookies than probably ordinary people in just about any other country, um, in large part because we have access to so many more resources, right? There's way more land. Why is there way more land? Because we have removed the indigenous population. Um, we have a lot more access to sugar and molasses. Again, why do we have that access? Because of slave plantations in the Caribbean and the American South. Um, and then because there's more land, more people are able to um, have their own successful farms, which means more people have bake ovens, right? So this is another image of a more typical uh, 19th century, early 19th century bake oven. He's putting a pie in there. He's got like this haunch. This is probably like lamb over here. This is maybe a ham, who knows what else, all kinds of stuff that he's gonna bake. Um, and this is the door, I think, here on the bottom. Um, but so the access to those bake ovens was also accompanied by access to more labor, right? Big estates had enslaved uh, kitchen staff. Later on, um, they also had more access to paid kitchen staff. You get the rise in some of our big cities of caterers and professional bakers so people can purchase uh, cookies. And then also in the 19th century, we get a ton of immigrants. <laughs> and they have very different traditions from British colonists and British Americans. Um, and so they bring they bring their own traditions, which come to be adopted by people outside of their, their immigrant group. So this is a brief overview of the types of people who are emigrating to the United States. We have colonists in the 17th and 18th centuries are largely English, Dutch, Spanish, Scottish, um, and then we do also have some um, religious groups fleeing <laughs> oppression in, in their native homeland. So there's Moravians, and we'll get into it a little bit, um, French Huguenots and Palestine Germans. In the ninth, early 19th century, the bulk of our immigrants are German and Irish. Um, in the late 19th century, we still have Irish um, and some Germans, but it's really more Scandinavians. We start to get Italians, Bohemians. Um, we do also get Middle Easterners, Eastern Europeans, and Chinese and other Asian immigrants, uh, at least until the 1890s when the Chinese Exclusion Act goes into effect. And then at the turn of the 20th century, we have a lot of Russians and Eastern Europeans, especially Jews. Um, Russian pogroms in the 1870s really push a lot of Jews uh, into uh, leaving and coming to the United States. And then we also do get um, Mediterranean groups, like in addition to Italians, we have Greeks, Lebanese, and Syrians. So let's talk a little bit about the Moravians, which you've maybe heard of because they have very strong Christmas traditions. So the Moravian church is one of the oldest, if not the oldest Protestant churches in the world. It's founded in the modern day Czech Republic in the 1400s. Um, it predates Martin Luther's 95 theses by about 40 years. <laughs> um, and they are among the first Protestant missionaries in the world. Uh, they come to the Americas in the 1740s. They have a mission with Mohican people in Dutchess County in New York in 1740. They're actually expelled in 1744. Why? Because we're in the middle of the French and Indian War. And Dutch and English colonists were confusing them with or thinking that they were actually Jesuit priests who were spies for the French. Um, and allying themselves or trying to ally themselves with local indigenous populations. So that's not true, but that's why they get kicked out. They also settle in Pennsylvania um, and found the city of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I believe apocryphally on Christmas Eve. And uh, they have a lot of Christmas traditions, mainly the development of a couple of special types of cookies. They have a Moravian spice cookie they develop a molasses cookie, and probably most importantly for the United States, they develop a sugar cookie, right? And so sugar cookies really become quite American in large part because of, of those first varieties uh, developed by the Moravians. Um, there is also a large group of Moravians that settle in New Salem, North Carolina, and Winston-Salem today is still quite famous for its Moravian cookies. The Germans are the progenitors of um, 
really of gingerbread and a number of other cookies. So gingerbread uh, can be traced to the late 1200s, right, 13th century in Ulm, Germany. It's called Lebkuchen. This guy right here is a Lebkuchener, right, Lebkuchener. Um, so he is a gingerbread baker. So he's got a bake oven back here and he has all of these beautiful molded gingerbreads that he's gonna load into the oven with his baking peel. We also have Springerly, uh, which is a little bit later, 14th century invented in Swabia. Uh, Zimsterna or cinnamon stars date to the 17th century. Pfeffernusa we did not get until 1753. And that is in large part because they contain quite a bit of nutmeg historically. Uh, and then of course the influence in the United States is um, the Palatine Germans early on. Um, we have the Pennsylvania Deutsch. People think they're from Holland, they're not, they're, they're German. And then again, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert help popularize um, a lot of German Christmas traditions. Uh, in England, which is still very influential in the United States during the Victorian era. So this is just a great little picture of some of the uh, Christmas treats, a little German postcard from the early 20th century, but we have fruit cakes, we have nuts, we have fruit, and then these cookies here are all uh, Lebkuchen, right? So they're all gingerbread. Some of them were frosted with chocolate later on. Springerly, I'm going to show a couple of recipes just because I think um, they're fun and interesting. This is from uh, the magazine American Cookery, which is the Boston Cooking School magazine. This is from December 1909 and has this great picture of Springerly, um, which are a molded cookie. You can see there's this wooden mold back here and all these beautiful figured cookies. They are usually square. They can also be um, made with a wooden rolling pin, right, that has the molds cut into it. So this is more of a paragraph style recipe, um, but it is, excuse me, egg, lemon, sugar, flour, um, and then you put it through the mold and then you let it um, sit overnight on top of, or sorry, bake it on top of anise seed, right? So that you have some anise flavor gets infused into the cookies and they are very white. Um, which is not typical, I think, of what we think of as like medieval, medieval cookies. Uh, this is another, another version, again, flavored with lemon and anise. And then this, I love this image, it's a modern picture of all these beautiful molds and you can see the very fine detailing that you can get on, on the cookies. So Lebkuchen is a little bit different than we maybe think of gingerbread. Um, it's sometimes flavored with just cinnamon, sometimes flavored with other spices. This is a simpler version. This is from uh, the Settlement Cookbook, the Settlement House Cookbook. So this is just flavored with cinnamon um, and citron. And then of course you have almonds in there, but they have a more complicated one that also calls for molasses and then a whole bunch of spices, allspice and nutmeg, um, plus citrus, plus chocolate, right? In addition to the other ingredients. And then these you're supposed to ice with frosting. Uh, this is a modern version of Lebkuchen. Um, and instead of being that molded kind, you can see they've used the frosting to create these beautiful um, figures, uh, all decorated. The hearts are very common. Um, St. Nicholas is a very common motif. Uh, and I think we have that switch to frosting um, rather than molds in large part because it is much easier to make a whole bunch of cookies with, with cookie cutters than it is with molds. Um, and the frosting is easier and less finicky than, than that relief of the molds. And also um, by the time we get to the 19th century, frosting is much cheaper. Uh, and more available than it was in the medieval period. Sephardusa, this is a very American recipe. It calls for corn syrup and molasses, right? And then it's got cinnamon, cloves, citron, almonds, and lemon juice. So again, it's got that citrus thing to it. And of course, in Germany, citrus fruits and almonds don't grow in Germany. So those all have to be imported. So that's really um, still into the 19th and early 20th century, a relic and today even a relic of that medieval interest in these in these very expensive ingredients that are no longer expensive because our, of our global economy. 
And so uh, this is the gluten-free recipe. Uh, Zim started the cinnamon stars. This is from a 1950s uh, edition of The Joy of Cooking. Uh, and it's basically uh, egg whites, sugar, almonds, cinnamon, and lemon. So there is no flour in these. They are, I guess, a type of macaroon, maybe almond macaroon. Um, and they are always cut in star shape. And then sometimes they're also glazed like this recipe. The Italians also are quite influential on our Christmas cookies. Um, I am not sharing recipes for the Italian cookies uh, in large part because I couldn't find very many historic ones, but also because especially here in the Northeast, there are so many Italian bakeries that make them. So you don't have to make them at home. So we have pizzelles, right? Which is a, a crisp pressed wafer again with like a relief design. Um, probably related to Dutch waffles, might be why Scandinavians have cream cracker, which we'll get into in the next slide. Biscotti, obviously, which are twice baked rusks. It's another word for the type of cookie that biscotti are. You bake it, you slice it, and then you bake it again to really get that really hard, crisp um, texture. I'm ready which are chewy almond cookies. Those are some of my favorites. Uh, Agnetti, which are frosted anise cookies. That is among one of the more popular um, Christmas cookies among Italian Americans today. There's strufoli, which are kind of a cookie. They're like these little fried balls of dough um, held together with honey. And then probably the most famous one, the tricolore or rainbow cookies, which is a tinted uh, colored almond sponge layered with apricot and raspberry jam, and then there's chocolate on the outside. Those are all, if they're well done, which not everybody does them well, <laughs> but if they're well done, those are also my favorite. Um, so they are invented in the late 19th century, um, I think in the United States in support of Italian unification. So that's why it's a three color, because that is the name of the Italian flag. It's three colors, the green, the white, and the red. Um, they become so popular in the United States that they start to be made outside of Italian jellies and they start to be made in Jewish jellies. And so then they kind of get renamed as rainbow cookies instead of tricolori because they're being made outside of that Italian tradition. And it's just a picture of biscotti. <laughs> um, okay, there's a lot of Scandinavian recipes in large part because I'm Scandinavian. <laughs> so I grew up with pretty much all of these cookies. Um, so we have pepper cocker, which are one of the older ones. It's a very thin, very crisp gingerbread um, spiced with black pepper. Very delicious, I love them. Usually cut into a heart or a star shape. And in my family, the tradition is if um, you had a heart-shaped one, you would put the heart-shaped cookie in your palm and press in the middle. And if it broke into three equal pieces, you can make a wish. Um, there's also spritz, which, probably start out as German. Um, there is a German cookie that is very, very similar, if not identical, but they usually dip theirs in, they're like S-shaped and they dip the ends in chocolate. Um, but I think the Scandinavians have pretty much perfected cookies made with just like butter and sugar, right? And spritz are definitely one of those. Um, Fatigman are not as common um, today, but they were used a lot historically um, and they are fried so it's a thin strip of dough and you put a slit in the middle sometimes people flip them through flip the bottom through the slit um, often they're just flat uh, and they are deep fried cream kaka is pictured here again really probably related to pizzelles um, not sure if they come by way of italy or possibly by way of the netherlands because um, early dutch waffles presses are also make just a very thin, crisp, raised cookie like this. The crumb cock is a little different because it's rolled and it tends to be even thinner than the pizzelles. Um, the pizzelles have to be a little bit thicker because they are served just round. Um, if you did that with crumb cock, they would just shatter. And often they do. So like um, growing up eating crumb cock, uh, little all the little ladies who made them because they're quite labor intensive would always like pack them with crumpled up wax paper or tissue paper to prevent them from breaking in transit. That's how delicate they are. Um, in the modern Scandinavian countries, some people do fill them 
with like jam or um, and or whipped cream. But when I grew up, they were always just served plain. And then the more recent ones are San Bacalse, uh, or San Bacles, uh, also sometimes called sand tarts. And the reason why those date to the 1850s is because of the, um, the baking tins. We didn't really have that accessible technology until the 1850s. So um, I'm from North Dakota, so I was very delighted when I found a 1920s North Dakota Agricultural Department uh, circular that was foods of many lands. So it was all of the immigrant foodways um, in North Dakota. So of course there's German and Scottish and all this other stuff, but there was a ton of Scandinavian recipes. So here you can see, this is the phonetic spelling, pepperkaka, right, Swedish version. Um, we have spirits, right? And so they really get introduced to the United States, of course, through German, but more heavily Scandinavian immigrants. Um, and thanks to that 1930s invention of the cookie press, by the 1950s, they have a huge revival. Everybody is making all kinds of spritz. The traditional is just an S shape or a wreath. Um, so a wreath is like, and then you have little tails on the end. Uh, but with American ingenuity, we have like a million different shaped presses and you can make stars and Christmas trees and flowers and you know, playing card suits. <laughs> if you're having a bridge party, that's the kind of thing that's happening. Um, so I grew up eating these two. And then there's like a million Zahnbacklse recipes in this little cookbooklet, which I thought was great. So I include them all. Most of them are flavored uh, with almond extract, right? That almond flavoring dating back to the medieval period. Here, they're also called sand tarts in addition to Zahnbacklse. Uh, and then these are what they look like. See, they have these, these little teeny fluted tins. They're usually about this big. Um, some people, again, will put stuff in the middle because they have a little bit of a hollow. Most people just eat them plain. And then Fatiman uh, are a little different because uh, most of the recipes call for sweet cream instead of um, butter. So you're making a cream-based dough and then deep frying it. And then there's like a million cream kaka <laughs> recipes. I love this part. These cookies resemble ice cream cones, but are served as an ordinary cookie, right? Uh, and then, of course, what's the American influence? We talked a little bit about Moravian cookies, but there are some others. Uh, you may have grown up making or eating uh, peanut butter blossoms. We also have the ubiquitous Mexican wedding cookie, also known as Russian tea cakes. Um, cut out cookies other than gingerbread become very popular in the United States and less so in other countries. Frosted sugar cookies, particularly sugar cookies that are frosted with buttercream frosting and not royal icing, also super American. Um, and then colored sugar and sprinkles, also super American. So if you do any of these things, congratulations, you are making very American Christmas cookies. Um, peanut butter blossoms, this is the one cookie that is also in the cookie time machine. Um, it was submitted as part of the 1957 Pillsbury Bake Off competition. Uh, Pillsbury Flour Company starting in, in 1949 hosted this annual Bake Off. People from all over the country, thousands of people would submit recipes. Um, this one is from Mrs. Mrs. Chester Smith in Gibsonburg, Ohio. Did not win the 1957 um, prize. It's, a, it's just like the senior category, senior citizen category um, winner, but not the grand prize winner. Um, but it's so popular that Hershey's Kisses start printing the recipe on the bag and then it's just like everybody starts making them and it just kind of takes over in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Everybody makes them. They're so good. They're so delicious. Peanut butter in general is super American. Peanut butter cookies are super American and Hershey's Kisses are super American. So it's like the most American Christmas cookie. And then there's that one cookie, right? Um, Mexican wedding cookies, Russian tea cakes, snowballs, whatever you call them, they probably have Middle Eastern origins. They're probably originally made with almonds or and or walnuts. Again, probably introduced to Europe through Moorish Spain. And then of course, pecans are native to the Americas. So when they migrate to Mexico, possibly 
via Spain, um, they substitute pecans for other nuts. And they're a buttery, rich cookie full of chopped nuts, um, usually rolled in powdered sugar, sometimes in a crescent shape. Um, sometimes they're in more of like a little flat shape. Sometimes they're round like these ones. They have this name Russian tea cakes. I don't know where this name came from. I haven't, like I found a historic recipe for Russian tea cakes from the turn of the 20th century and it was for an actual tea cake. It was not this recipe <laughs> and they don't make them in Russia. So who knows where that came from? Maybe it's just the association of Russian tea rooms, right? Maybe that's where the association comes from. No, nobody's quite sure. Uh, they are also called snowballs. Some people call them pecan sandies. I'm like, that's a different thing. You don't put powdered sugar on pecan sandies. I don't think anyway. Um, but now pretty much everyone makes them because especially if you have a food processor, they're very easy to make. And then why do we leave cookies for Santa, right? So this is um, leaving treats for magical Christmas time visitors is something that other people do in other countries, uh, but it's usually not cookies. Uh, in Norway, they have uh, Nissa, which is like a little elf household spirit um, that has become very associated with Christmas. They get a romigat, which is a type of cream porridge, very rich. Uh, in Norway, the tomte, which are the, or sorry, in Sweden, the tomte, which are the sweetest version of Nissa, they get rice pudding, also in Denmark. In Britain, Santa gets sherry. <laughs> Uh, in Germany, they don't leave food out at all. Instead, they leave letters. In the Netherlands, um, they leave carrots and hay for, sorry, I got cut off, uh, for uh, St. Nicholas's uh, mule or donkey, right? Other people will also do it for Santa's reindeer, right? Um, but in the United States, we leave cookies and milk probably because dairy is ubiquitous in the United States in ways that it is not in other countries. Also, we very strongly associate milk with children. Same with cookies. Um, and there are some theories that it may have been, it may stem from the tradition of, you know, in a time when there weren't hotels and the roads were terrible and people were traveling long distances that took a long time during the holidays, um, this tradition that you would leave food out and your door unlocked um, in case travelers came through and needed and needed shelter. So that's one of the theories of, of where this, this overnight treat comes from. Uh, interestingly, one of the earliest print references to cookies and milk for Santa is uh, from I think the 1870s. And it's a little girl expressing uh, skepticism that Santa is actually the one eating <laughs> the cookies and milk. Um, so how do Christmas cookies become a tradition in the United States? Because they are not necessarily a tradition for a lot of the time that the United States has been settled by Europeans. Um, part of it has to do with really a lot of things happening in the mid 19th century. We have some changes in our agricultural processes. Um, once we get like the Erie Canal, and especially once we get railroads, uh, that allows more and more people to move to the Northern Great Plains. So the bread basket of America shifts from like Pennsylvania and New York to like the Ohio River Valley, and then really out to, you know, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, that area. So refined white flour becomes super cheap and widely accessible. Um, sugar becomes super cheap and widely accessible thanks in part to slavery, but also in part to um, some changes in the technology we use to process sugar. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we start to get more and more um, innovation in terms of chemical leaveners. So we have our royal baking powder ad with the little gingerbread man, right, while this adorable little baby is sleeping. Um, so we start out with pearl ash, which dates back to the late 18th century, and then we get baker's ammonia. Some people still do um, ammonia cookies, sugar cookies for Christmas, um, baking soda and baking powder, which is a combination of baking soda and um, cream of tartar, right? And so those allow us to make a whole bunch more cookies. Not many of the cookies that I shared tonight, the recipes have these things in there, right? Because they're very old, but in the United States, we do start to get more variety of cookies. Um, our kitchen technologies change 
The biggest one being uh, we move away from hearth cooking and bake ovens to cast iron stoves. That makes a huge difference. And then particularly in the 20th century, when we start to get um, gas and electric stoves, that also makes a huge difference. Uh, the introduction of refrigerators, ice boxes too, but really refrigerators, we start to get the development of chilled doughs. A lot of sugar cookie doughs in particular have to be chilled before they're baked. We get the slice and bake ice box cookies. So I just wanted to compare and contrast um, about a 30 year difference in American kitchens. Um, so this is from around the 1840s, maybe 1830s, judging by the clothing. But this is a typical, you know, middle class kitchen. There's a hearth, there's no bake oven. We have all these giant cast iron cauldrons. This is called a tin kitchen or um, a tin oven, and it's basically a roasting spit. Here's the turning handle, and that's why there's a chair here. And it's for roasting meat. You cannot bake in a tin kitchen, but um, it reflects some of that technology with tin. And so what are we making? We're making pie crust because that is the easiest dessert to make in this kitchen. This kitchen is from around the 1870s, right? We have running water, there's taps in the wall, we have a sink and we have this giant cast iron stove right, that allows us to do all kinds of things. We still have these heavy cast iron cauldrons, but we can bake much more easily. Um, and we're still making pie, because <laughs> that's super American, right? So why else are we making Christmas cookies at Christmas? How does this become a thing in the 20th century? Um, there's a big push in the 1940s to send boxes of treats, particularly Christmas cookies, to our troops during the holiday season of World War II. Um, so I think that kind of solidifies it as a national thing. In the 1950s and 60s, there's an explosion of cookie or Christmas related cookbooks um, and cookie related cookbooks like this quite famous Betty Crocker's cookie book, still with that old fashioned spelling. And if you look, here's spritz, you know, here's a candy cane, here's a gingerbread cutout, you know, there's all these other sugar cookie cutouts. So it's not specifically uh, Christmas, but there are a lot of Christmas cookies included in this cookbook. We also have, by the time we get to the mid 20th century, we are on second and even third generation immigrants. Um, so third generation immigrants in particular um, tend to have their, their connection to their heritage severed. So generally first generation immigrants do not teach their children language and traditions in the United States because they want their children to Americanize. Second generation um, immigrants kind of reject their parents' ideas as being old fashioned. And so third generation is usually the ones that want to reconnect with their roots. Um, so we're getting there in the mid and late 20th century. Um, and then also food is like the last thing to go, right? When you're talking about cultural things, particularly around the holidays. So like we didn't really eat Scandinavian food at any other time of year except for Christmas, just an example. And I am a fourth and fifth generation Scandinavian immigrant. So what's the future hold when it comes to cookies? Are we gonna keep making cookies at Christmas time, right? We have all these dietary restrictions now. Store-bought cookies are everywhere. There's all these fancy like artisan made cookies if we've probably seen them. I know someone who who makes like these beautifully decorated royal icing cookies for a job like she owns her own business. Um, cookie swaps really start in the mid to late 20th century. You have a lot more working moms. People are busier. Um, nobody wants to make three dozen of 10 types of cookies. <laughs> They're like, I'll make 10 dozen of one type of cookie and then swap with 10 other people. <laughs> And we can each have a dozen of all these different types, right? So that makes things a little easier, but are people really doing cookie swaps anymore? If we're going to a cookie swap and it's all store-bought cookies, you know, there's the whole diet culture nonsense around do we want to even be eating these rich foods at the holidays? And then do we need traditions? And these traditions are not as old as they appear. So I don't know what the future of 
Christmas cookies is. I will probably still make them because I like cookies. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think? And do you have any questions? I see there's like a million questions in the chat. So uh, I'm just gonna check and make sure if there's any questions that I missed. Oh yes, Ashley has Persian. Yeah, there's some interesting Middle Eastern cookies that I think are under studied. Yeah, they use a lot um, of like chickpea flour and then or rice flour and they're not super sweet, which I like a lot. Yeah, there's also, um, I think they're called mamul. Um, I've read this really great poignant story about a, a woman writing about an Arab woman traveling in, in an airport and she only spoke um, Arabic. And so this woman had to translate, but she had this, this Arabic woman had with her um, mamul cookies, which are like date, they're kind of like, they look sort of like um, Mexican wedding cookies, but they have a date filling and they're covered in powdered sugar. And so she's like sharing them with everybody. Such a great story. Oh, Ashley, you have to, what are Turdili and Chinuili? I don't know how to pronounce yeah, that. Okay, my, so my <laughs> father-in-law pronounced them Turdili and Kinulile. And he, okay. so yeah, I, I posted a link to the recipe. They're one of the ones that I want to um, reshoot, but the, the dough is weird. It's, um, it's flour, a whole bottle of sweet vermouth, a lot of vegetable oil and olive oil, and then eggs, sugar, orange zest, salt, and cinnamon. And then the filling is in the quino, quino lily, quino lily? I don't know. I'm not, I'm also not Italian, but uh, it's a <laughs> mixture of walnuts, honey, raisins, and some grape jelly. And so those ah. get filled, they're kind of like little empanada shapes. Yeah. Um, and that the other ones are made of the same, but they're kind of like more like little nuggets, like little circles. Yeah. Um, and then they glaze them with honey, like this giant bowl of honey. I can't believe there's a whole bottle of vermouth. It's, I mean, well, it's, let's see. And basically it's an fine. entire it's, five pound bag of flour. Yeah, five pound. Like they, I mean, they make like, <laughs> and they last a really long time because I guess maybe because they're coated in the honey, but also because they're so like, they're not like, I don't know, they don't have a ton of things in them, but the inside's very preserved. So um, yeah, the wine probably also acts yeah. as kind of a preservative in the oil. Of, of and, course yeah. it's Italian, put wine that, in there. I mean, that's so, I don't. <laughs> that sounds like a very old recipe yeah. judging by the ingredients and like I've how had, it's made yeah i've had some people reach out saying like they've been looking for a recipe like that from their you know grandmothers or whoever so um yeah yeah because are there any um spices oh cinnamon okay cinnamon. well, cinnamon's been around i mean cinnamon and black pepper have like date back to the roman empire so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Very, yeah, very and then like you know they use of... like a coffee can to cut them. We would use a glass or whatever, but yeah. But there's like the bowl that's the bowl that's the biggest that you have to use that one to make it. Right, because you're gonna you put five pounds in, in the honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is great. What a cool cookie! I have never heard of that at all. Um, but there's a lot of cookies I haven't heard of. I'm not I'm like a cookie expert per se, except for maybe on Scandinavian cookies, but. Cool, what a great, what a great thing to share. Thank you for sharing that. Um, does anybody else have a question about other cookies or want to share any of their holiday traditions? You can, um, I think you can unmute yourself if you want to. No. All right, I have one other Italian one that I learned from them. Sure. It's like different, just since nobody else um, has yeah, anything. Go for it. This was more of like an Easter thing. Um, and I don't know the actual name of them, but that's the link. So I had my husband's aunt show me how to make them. And you, um, it's like Crisco and again with the orange, um, but there's not really a lot of flavor in them and they're not very sweet. And you roll out big logs and then you have to you have to do this like method to form them into these little like twirly flower shapes. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But those also were like very different for me than anything that I grew up with. Um, and they told me Christmas and Easter is when they had them like in Calabria. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah, cool. So for those who didn't click on the link, um, again, nine cups of flour. <laughs> and then it's cinnamon and orange and shortening, which may have been lard historically. Nine eggs, but only two cups of sugar for nine cups of flour. Yeah. Yeah, the big batches, they had a lot of kids, I feel like. So they like needed a ton of cookies. Well, and I think also, um, you know, all pretty much it seems like Chris's cookie recipes make up, but just like makes a hundred dozen. <laughs> like who needs that many? But I think it's because people were having big, giant parties and, you know, you like want to bake once and then you have cookies all month. Um, yeah, interesting interesting and or so are they more crisp are they like a crisp cookie or are they more tender the outside is like a little bit it's harder than like a like a southern buttermilk biscuit type of biscuit but they're still soft inside the other ones that I shared are a little more um firm like all the way yeah so yeah. the the twisty the twisty easter ones are more that's almost more like a pastry that, yeah yeah, interesting because they look like they're a crunchy cookie because of how they're shaped. It's to be fair, it's also been several years since I've had them, but from what yeah. I remember, they were like a little softer than that. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, great. Um, oh, Katie says, are there vegetable or meat cookies? Would they be considered cookies? I mean, mince meat has meat in it, uh, and that's you know. Hey, I'm a minute. This sounds very similar. Um, Katie shared Sicilian chocolate meat cookie recipe. I want to say hello, so I'll be back. Okay. So uh, this has fatty ground beef with almonds, candied fruit, chocolate, cinnamon, nutmeg, and that's the filling. Interesting. So that, because it has chocolate in it, is uh, probably, um, you know, in, let's see, if it's from Sicily, Chocolate is probably first introduced by the Spanish Empire to Italy, so that's like 14th, 15th century. Um, so that's probably dates to around that time period or maybe a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, minced meat definitely is meat. Can't think of any other cookies that have meat in them, but there are a lot of, there's like a pork cake tradition um, around Christmas and, uh, you know, there are cookies. I'm actually researching right now. I haven't told anybody this, but I'm researching um, bacon fat gingerbread because apparently that's a thing at the turn of the 20th century in the United States and possibly earlier. So um, I'm collecting some recipes on that and I'm going to do a blog post on that. Um, and I can't think of any specific, like, I think because cookies are supposed to be crisp, um, they tend not to have ingredients that are going to impact that, if that makes sense. Because um, most, most of like the meat and vegetable desserts are not cookies, they're cakes or pies. Um, just trying to think, I can't think of any other meat related ones. So that's a cool, I mean, the Sicilian one looks, they look like tiny minced pies is what they look like with chocolate. Um, I am also just going to share because if anybody's interested in the 20th century, stuff uh the cookie time machine just drop that link from the kitchen.com right in there if anybody wants to check that out um and are there any other questions before we close for the evening no have I inspired everyone to do some holiday baking? I'm going to do some this. I have not been able to do holiday baking for like a couple of years. So I have like two weeks around Christmas off from work. Uh -huh. so I'm hopefully going to make a whole bunch of cookies. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're always amazing. It's always so enjoyable. It's so, so fun. Much. I mean, you know, as a food historian that other people get excited about food history makes me excited about <laughs> yes uh lisa says yes now i want to do holiday baking <laughs> so thanks for inspiring us yeah and thank you all for joining us all right sarah's coming back in april so check out the <laughs> library calendar <laughs> all right have a good holiday sarah and yeah, good you holidays too. to everyone else good See night you everybody thank you